Annie Armstrong is in full swing, and our church goal is $2,021. And I'm not quite sure where we're at on that number because we're transitioning in the office right now, but I would like to remind you I have issued a pastor's challenge similar to Jason issuing one for Lottie Moon. My challenge is $3,000. If we as a body can raise $3,000 for the North American Mission Board, I will allow, allow Pastor Jason to throw a pie into my face in front of all of you. And the, uh, the inside of the pie, the contents of the pie, will be determined by the staff, and I will not know what was in the pie until it's all over me. <laughs> and just to make things even, Jason will have to issue his loudest, most emphatic Arkansas Razorback hog call. So I think he can do that. It's a, a little easier than victory in Jesus, I would say. I don't know. <laughs> All right. One other thing, we do have a children's ministry workshop today at 1 p.m. here in the worship center. So if you work with children, want to work with children, that's the place to be. Lunch will be provided in the worship center. All right. Let's go ahead and continue worship and bow together and pray together. Lord, thank you for uh, the fun that we can have as believers as we gather up our resources to enable people to accomplish the mission that you have set us to, to share the gospel. Father, I pray that you would help us to reach down deep, to give sacrificially, but also cheerfully. Father, thank you. Uh, we pray for worship today, that it would be pleasing to you, that our faith in you would be evident and pleasing, Father. Be glorified, be praised. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and continue.
know who stands behind the God of angel armies is always by my side the one who reigns forever he is a friend of mine the God of angel armies is always by my side I know who goes before percent of its total content to telling us about Joseph, a man who wasn't even in the messianic line. 
If we were writing the book of Genesis, we would have talked about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Judah. Because when the Son of God stepped off the throne of the universe to enter into human life, he didn't come through the tribe of Joseph, either Ephraim or Manasseh. He came through the tribe of Judah. So why does the Holy Spirit devote 25% of the book of Genesis to tell us about a man who wasn't even in the Messianic line? Well, I'll tell you. He was in the Messianic likeness. And everywhere you touch the book of Genesis and the story of Joseph, if you have a discerning eye, you're going to think of Jesus. on out at this time any children third grade and under you may take off right now and meet the volunteers in the back i want to invite the rest of you to take your bible in your hands and turn with me this morning to genesis 42 genesis 42 and now you think about it if the book of genesis means beginnings and if this morning we are coming to the end of our sermon series in the book of genesis then that means that we are coming to the end of the beginning, right? Is everybody awake this morning? I need your help today, okay? Well, as we look to finish Genesis this morning, next week is Palm Sunday. Uh, the week following that is Easter. And so we have a great few weeks in front of us in God's Word together. Genesis begins with creation. In the beginning... God created, Genesis 1-1. And then Genesis ends with a coffin. Joseph died at the age of 110, and they embalmed him and placed him in a coffin in Egypt. So, begins with creation, ends with a coffin, begins with life, ends with death. The question is, what has gone wrong? How did we get here? Well, there was a young preacher by the name of Pastor Custin Jordery, and he had just arrived in a new community. Not long after Pastor Custin arrived there, he got a phone call from the local funeral home director, and the man said, unfortunately, I've got this fella here that has passed away, and it's so sad that he has no family and no friends. And so I'm wondering, Pastor Custin, could you come down here to the local cemetery and perform the graveside service. So Pastor Custin Jordery agreed to do so, and when the time came, he left early for the service because he did not want to be late. But along the way, he took wrong turns and got all messed up, and finally he arrived, and he was 30 minutes, maybe going on an hour late for this graveside service, and he saw no hearse in sight. He saw the hole, and he saw the workmen sitting over there, and they were eating their lunch and so he felt so bad he, he walked over and he looked at that hole he saw that the lid was already placed on top and and he, he thought you know this man deserves a proper burial so Pastor Custin opened his Bible and he began to preach one of the most beautiful graveside services this world has ever heard those workers who were sitting close by were awestruck by his words and so impressed as, as he went on and on and on in fact, he pressed on and he had been preaching 30 minutes of this graveside service. And finally, one of the workers was sitting there. His name was Bristian Curd. Y'all know him, don't you? And old Bristian Curd, he spoke up to the other workers there and he said, You fellas think we ought might to tell that preacher that he's preaching over a septic tank? <laughs> now, I must confess to you that there's crazy things that happen in the ministry. Early on for me as a young pastor, I was visiting this lady in the hospital and dear lady of the church and, and I was sitting there praying with her. She was very sick and when I finished praying, I thought she'd say, oh thank you, you know, but instead she said, preacher, honey, you are sitting on my bedside commode. I have never done that again, let me just say. But while I was sitting there and she said that, I thought, how did I get here? <laughs> It's an apt question for Genesis. How did we get here? And the, the short answer, of course, is sin. Sin moved mankind from life 
to death. And as we walk through Genesis, we, it seems like we're either going to a wedding, a birthday, or we're going to a funeral. There are side roads, there are wrong turns along the way, there are many how did we get here moments that are within. But there is, there is a constant. There is one who is constant. And the one who is, con- is constant is God himself. He just continues to carry out his plan of salvation and his purposes, and it just goes right along. And so this morning, are you ready for this? We're going to walk through Genesis 42 through 50. Now, before you have a panic attack, breathe deep, okay? We're going to walk through these chapters with a highlighter in our hands, and we are going to highlight the main ideas. Do you have your highlighter handy? All right, let's go. Chapter 42. Joseph tests. He tests his brothers. And so our attention turns back to Joseph. Last week we came to understand that Joseph was God's only means of salvation to Egypt in the middle of a famine. We also saw that the peoples of the lands came and they bowed down before him. In Genesis 42.6, even Joseph's brothers are bowing their faces down to the ground before Joseph. And We're going to pick up right there with his brothers before him. And when Joseph saw his brothers, he immediately recognized them. He knew who they were. But instead of saying, hey, brothers, how how are you guys doing? Or as we would say in Georgia, how's your mama and them? Instead of saying that, he just goes right along and he's going to test them. And so he treats them as strangers. Meanwhile, his brothers, they don't recognize him at all. In fact, Joseph accuses them of being spies sent to check out the weaknesses of the land. So, get this, Joseph said, you are spies. And their response back to Joseph was, listen, we just came here to eat. You know, I got to studying that a little deeper. And did you know some scholars actually believe this might be the first reference to Baptist right here? Hey, we just, we just came to eat. That's why we're here. I don't know about all that other stuff. You know, Baptists excel in spying out the dessert table, if you didn't know that. And anyway, Joseph's brothers said that they had just come to purchase grain. And so Joseph didn't press them here at all. And they should have just left well enough alone. But again, like Baptists at the Baptist beauty shop, they kept on talking. And, and here's what happened. They offered this information. We were 12 brothers, but our youngest brother is back with our father, that's Benjamin, and one of our brothers is no longer living. Now, there's no telling how many times they had told this story, but this is the first time that, that, that they have told the story about the dead brother to the dead brother. And so it gets kind of awkward really fast here. The fact is, they don't really know if Joseph is dead or alive, but they certainly have left out out a lot of details. There's no mention of a pit. There's no mention of selling him into slavery. He's just gone. And so, old Joseph, he gets the last word on the matter. The last word. Does anybody know what the most common last words are for a redneck? The famous last words for redneck. Hey, watch this. That's the famous last words of a redneck right there. (laughs) So, listen. Somebody's back there meddling. I don't know what that was. (laughs) Joseph said, I'm going to have the last word. He said, I have spoken. You are spies. It's kind of like that guy Mandalorian, I have spoken. Or like, like your parents. Some of you are parents right now. Do you ever get to the place with your kids where you just finally say, listen, I've spoken. This is the end of the conversation. It's the way it's going, going to be. And Joseph does that. They're like, we just came to eat. He said, no, I've spoken. You are spies, period. And here comes the test. Joseph has his brothers in prison for three days to check their words, and on the third day he sets them free, but there's a caveat. One brother will have to stay behind. It's called collateral. And the others will return home. 
Now, if they go home and return back to Joseph with their younger brother, Benjamin, then he will let them all go free. So the brothers move over to the side, and they are over here kind of talking about it amongst themselves, and Joseph is listening in. They don't know that he understands their language because he has been speaking to them through an interpreter. And and the brothers over here talking conclude that God is punishing them now for what they did to Joseph. And Reuben, old Reuben was the firstborn, he he remembered back to how it had happened before they put Joseph in the pit. He remembered that he had warned them that God would punish them. He had warned them of that outcome. But Reuben, feeling kind of sandwiched at the moment, went along with it. And now he says, I told you so. I told you that this was going to happen. And listening in and understanding, Joseph began to weep. He wept privately. And then he secretly ordered that their bags be filled to overflowing with food, but also with silver. And so Joseph's brothers return to their father, but Simeon, second born, stays behind back with Joseph as collateral. Somewhere along the way, the brothers open their bags and they discover the silver. Now they had used silver to pay for the food. So when they saw the silver in their bags, this was. Not good. And so there is a theme that emerges, 42, 28, and they were trembling. 42, 35, and they were afraid. And when they finally reached their father Jacob and they shared what had happened in Egypt with the man who was in charge, Joseph, and how they were required to return back with Benjamin, Jacob's youngest son, everything just sort of froze. Pause. You remember what we talked about last week? We pointed out that Joseph and Benjamin, out of all those 12 sons, they were the only two sons that were born to Rachel, the wife that Joseph dearly loved. And and you'll remember that when when they were leaving behind his father-in-law Laban and they were headed out to meet Esau and they didn't know what would happen and they were fearful that Esau would try to retaliate, that Joseph put his company, his family in a certain order to keep them safe based on priority. So he took the slave concubines, Bilhah and Zilpah, and put them in the front with their children. And then behind them, he put Leah and her children. And then in the very back, in the safest position, who do we find? We find Rachel and we find Joseph. Benjamin was not yet born. So we understand how much he loved Rachel and therefore how much he loved Joseph and how much by extension he loved Benjamin. And now he's already been told Joseph is dead, even though he's not. And now he's being asked to send Benjamin. And so in that context, he says, it's me that you make childless. Joseph is gone. Simeon is gone. Now you want them to take Benjamin. And you hear him even to his brothers saying, if you take Benjamin, I'm childless. So in that moment, the firstborn, Reuben, rose up and said, I'll do it. I'll take responsibility. I'll take responsibility to take Benjamin, take him to Joseph, not by name. Take him to the man in charge, and I will bring him back or else. And to that, Jacob simply says, no. Chapter 43, Joseph's brothers return. The famine was even more severe. And you remember last week, again, Jacob sitting around, the famine's going on. He said, why are we all sitting around here when our pantries are bare and when the grocery store shelves are empty? And and we heard that they opened that new Harmon's up in Idaho and it's full of stuff. We'll go there. And so they sent the sons off. He sent the sons off not to Idaho but to Egypt. To get the food. Well, now the famine is even more severe, and so he tells his sons, Go back and buy a little food. Now, that just stood out to me. Buy a little food. Have you ever had your kids come up to you and say, Can I have some ice cream? No. For the 100,000th time, no. You have not cleaned your room yet, but I just want a little bit. I just want a little ice cream, but you haven't cleaned your room yet. 
They're saying, we are supposed to bring Benjamin back. If we go back without Benjamin, he's going to say, where's Benjamin? And you can say, we just want a little bit. We just want a little food. And then there's a shift in Genesis 43.3. Reuben had been the voice, and his voice fades, firstborn. And Judah's voice emerges. He's the fourthborn. And why does Reuben's voice fade? Genesis 35.22. While Israel was living in that region beyond Bethel, Reuben went in and was intimate with his father's concubine, Bilhah, and Israel heard about it. Now get the picture. Jacob and Leah's firstborn son, Reuben, goes in and takes for himself his own father's wife, Rachel's slave, and knows her intimately. This also happens to be the mother of his brothers, Dan and Naphtali. This is just like straight out of Jerry Springer or something, isn't it? And it is with his stepmom that he defiled his father's bed. If you were here last week, this will make sense. If you, if you weren't, then it won't. You'll have to go back and watch that message. But I did reach out to that Alabama graduate on this particular passage, and he said no comment. <laughs> so Reuben's untrustworthy voice fades, and Judah's voice enters. Judah basically offers the very same thing that Reuben did. Give me the responsibility. I will take Benjamin to Egypt. I'll return with him and with Simeon. Entrust me with this. And and you know what? He even manages to kind of get a jab in. He said, if we had not delayed, we could have been back twice by now. (laughs) I, I know we often say that with our kids. Again, talking about ice cream. If you had quit asking for ice cream and clean your room, it would have been done. You could have cleaned that room three times by now and had not only one bowl of ice cream, but two bowls. I'm passionate about that. So Jacob says, if it must be so, then go do this. Take the best products of the land, and he names them. Double the silver. Take back what they sent with you, plus what you're going to use to buy more grain. And then take Benjamin and go. And listen to his prayer. May God Almighty cause the man, Joseph, he doesn't know that, but may he cause the man to be merciful to you. And in this moment, God is actually taking Jacob's prayers and aligning them with his plan and with what he is doing. God's been at work all along. And now Jacob is asking God to do the thing that's about to happen. And it's all just coming together beautifully. So they went down and they stood before Joseph. And Joseph saw Benjamin. And immediately he recognized Benjamin. Can you imagine everything going through his mind? This is the one brother that he has from his mother Rachel. All right? And they haven't seen each other in so long. And so Joseph told the steward, go down and slaughter an animal And prepare it, for we are going to eat together today at noon. We're going to have a party. And so they went down to this lady. We'll just call her Mariah Corberry. And they thought that Mariah had a little lamb, but actually it was a goat. And everywhere that Mariah went, she carried that goat in her tote. And since her goat was a bit too small, they decided to eat something bigger after all. And so Mariah kept that goat, and they catered in fried chicken and french fries from some Egyptian pyramid-shaped establishment called the Hard Rock Cafe. I know, just stay with me. I'm just trying to keep you awake. You you see, Mariah, that we know, wants a goat. Did you know that? Mariah wants a little goat. And Pastor Justin won't let her have one. Will y'all join me in praying? For Pastor Justin to let Mariah have a little goat. But in all seriousness, the brothers have been invited to lunch. And they were continuing to grow more and more afraid of Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin, he became overwhelmed again with emotions. And he began to weep. And so picture this meal. You have Joseph eating in one place. You have the Egyptians eating in another place. And then you have the brothers, the Hebrews, eating in in another place as well. And the reason is because the Egyptians, for them, it was detestable to eat with the Hebrews. 
But what was really interesting is when the Hebrews were set up and were eating, the brothers themselves were astonished that this man in charge had somehow put them positioned according to their birth order around the table. How did he know that? How, how did he do this thing? And so they're astonished, and they all ate and drank together at this great feast. They have returned. Chapter 44, Judah arises, or Judah strikes back. Joseph told his steward to once again fill their bags full and overflowing with food, return their silver, but to also put his own silver cup, Joseph's own silver cup, in the bag of his youngest brother, Benjamin. And so Joseph sent them off, and once he saw that their donkeys were riding away into the distance, he told his steward to run them down. And so he did, and they pulled the children of Israel over, and they accused them of stealing Joseph's cup. And of course, they vehemently denied this accusation because they didn't. And they pled with him, why would we come here and return all that silver if we were wanting to steal from you? It makes no sense. If one of our brothers has stolen, may he be put to death and may we be your slaves. And so the steward searched carefully and what did he find but Joseph's silver cup in Benjamin's bag. It's the it's the worst possible outcome. Jacob's precious son, Rachel's lone remaining son, now condemned to death by their own words. And they cried out and they tore their clothes and then they loaded their donkeys back up and headed back to Joseph. And once again, the brothers offered themselves to Joseph as slaves. But Joseph counters and says, No, you're not going to be my slaves. I want you to just leave Benjamin here with me and return to your father. Uh, say it again. Just leave Benjamin and return to your father. And so now it's Judah who once again speaks up and he addresses Joseph and he says, can we go and speak privately? And so over here off to the side, he said, if we were to leave Benjamin here, our father would surely die. And I will bear the guilt of his death as the responsible one. Remember, he had taken responsibility. Please keep me in his place. What a beautiful picture of Judah being willing to lay down his life for his brother. It would be through the line of Judah, ultimately, that Jesus would come. And he would lay down his life for the sins of the world. And we hear Judah here saying, I could not bear to see the grief that would overwhelm my father. Judah arises, and he is a man. He is rejecting passivity. He is leading courageously on behalf of Israel. Chapter 45, we see Joseph unveiled. The brothers had been operating in fear of Joseph. His identity was still unknown to them, but Joseph had been battling his own emotions, and so he kept having, you notice he keeps having to run over into the corner so he can weep and so others won't see him. Joseph kind of reminds me of a young man who's finally gotten up the courage to prepare a meal for his girl. And so he invites her over and he's preparing that meal. And all of a sudden he realizes that he should have used a recipe that did not call for the red onion. Because he keeps chopping and the tears keep flowing and he keeps trying to hide them. And it's a terrible situation. And that's what, that's what he's doing. He's trying to hide back his tears. But Joseph presses on. And his tears, by the way, serve notice of the grace that we are getting ready to see poured out. And so Joseph sent everybody away besides his brothers. And the text says that he wept so loud that the Egyptians heard it. And also Pharaoh's household. There has not been crying heard that loud since that day until BYU got put out last night in the first round. And he could no longer keep his composure. And he said, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? And they were terrified. Not because he was crying, but because they feared what kind of retaliation he might take. It's like standing before Esau all over again. And Joseph, seeing their fear, he invites them to come near, and they do. And he says to them, 
I am the one that you sold into Egypt. Boy, that was reassuring, wasn't it? And then he adds, Now don't be grieved and angry with yourselves for selling me here because God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. How awesome is that? You tried to kill me, but God raised me up and he sent me here to save your life and to save the lives of countless others. And it doesn't stop there. Do you remember the promise that God made to Abraham earlier in Genesis? And by extension, Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. Now Joseph is standing here and there are future eternal ramifications to that, pro to that promise. And it says here, not only did God send me to preserve life, but God also sent me ahead to preserve you as a remnant. In other words, God's going to keep his promise. He said, listen, we've seen two years of famine. There's five more coming, and you ain't seen nothing yet. And so God sent me here to preserve you as a remnant in the land to keep you by a great deliverance. Therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler over the land of Egypt. Do you hear it? He's saying, it wasn't you. It wasn't me. It wasn't Pharaoh. It was God who did this thing. And Joseph said, go quickly to my father and say, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me without delay and you can settle in the land of Goshen and be near me. I will sustain you, all of you, for there will be five more years of famine. Otherwise, you will become destitute. And so in this moment, their obedience is tied directly to the command and to the preservation of the remnant. And so then they are brought before Pharaoh. And if I could just sum up what Pharaoh says, he says, do what Joseph said. Do what he said. And there's more to it than that, but that's the gist of it. And, and he provides them with all the provisions for the journey, including the wagons and the donkeys and the food. And here's my favorite part that I'd never seen before until studying this this week. So Joseph is standing out there. His brothers are getting ready to leave with all that, those provisions provided by Pharaoh. And so he's getting ready to tell them bye. Picture your parents or picture being the parents and you're standing out there in the driveway and your kid's backing out of the road. And you say, love you. Love you. Drive safe. Is that what you say? Or as Tim Hawkins, the great comedian, said, love you. Drive fast and take chances. So Joseph is out there in the driveway and they're getting ready to back out on their camels and the vehicles that Pharaoh's providing. And what does he say to them? He says, not I love you, but he says, brothers, don't you argue on the way. Isn't it interesting? Don't you argue on the way? He has been away from them all this time and yet he still knows them well, doesn't he? And they arrived in Canaan. They told Jacob the whole story. He didn't believe it. But when he looked out to see what they had been transported in, it says that the spirit of their father, Jacob, was revived. And he got excited and said, Woohoo, Joseph is alive. Let's go see him before I die. Get my walking stick, you will. Forget my oxygen tank, you won't. Let's go. Chapter 46. Jacob's road trip. We have a name shift here from Jacob to Israel. God met with him along the way in Beersheba and said to him, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you back. Joseph will close your eyes when you die. There's a lot of good stuff packed in there. I am with you. Don't be afraid. I will make you great. I will bring you back. You will see Joseph before you die. All of that packed in that passage. And so on they went to Egypt. Jacob was carried away in the wagon that Pharaoh had brought down to him so that he could be transported to Egypt. And I don't know about you, but I found this fascinating. Think about it. Pharaoh provided the vehicles to bring the children of Israel into Egypt. And later, another Pharaoh will use his vehicles to chase Israel towards the sea. Here we're on this road trip. Jacob and all his offspring, they come to Egypt. 
And, and I'm going to fast forward just a little bit for the sake of time. But what I want you to know is that there are 70 persons now that come in. You remember that um, Leah had had some sons. She had had four sons. Bilhah had two sons. Zilpah had two sons. Then Leah had two more sons. And then finally Rachel had two sons for a total of 12. And now there are more than 70 people that make up this family. And so as they're on their way, all of them together, Jacob sends a runner on ahead to Joseph to let them know that they were arriving in Goshen. And they wasted no time running out to him. Here comes Joseph. He throws his arms around his father, and they weep for a long time. And, and in my mind, I, I'm thinking, I wonder what's going through Jacob's mind. So he's hugging Joseph, and they're weeping. I wonder if he thinks back to that moment when he met his wife, Rachel, and he gave her that first kiss right on the mouth, and he started weeping. Do you remember that last week? And all these memories are going through his mind, and they were both weeping like a baby in a church nursery that had delayed its Costco diaper run. What happens next? Joseph weeps out of deep emotion. He never thought he would see his father again, and his father never thought he would see him again either because he believed he was dead. That's what he had been told. And now seeing him, he said, I am ready to die. Now that I have seen your face and you are still alive. And Joseph says, listen, i got to go get Pharaoh. Y'all wait right here for just a minute. And when he gets back, just remember, if he asks you your occupation, you tell him you're shepherds. Got it. Chapter 47. A new temporary home. Pharaoh rushes to meet Jacob. He permits these shepherds to settle in Goshen. But listen to what Pharaoh says when Jacob walks up. So Jacob walks up, and Pharaoh says, How many years have you lived? Well, that'll bless your heart, won't it? I mean, my goodness, uh, you sure do look worn out. You know, how old are you anyway? Did, did, were you ever on the boat with Noah? Just curious. And very graciously, Jacob responds, My pilgrimage has lasted 130 years. My years have been few and hard, and they have not reached the years of my fathers during their pilgrimages. You know, when I read that, you know, my years have been few and hard, I thought, you know, a lot of us can, can relate a little bit looking back at this year. In fact, uh, I want you to look at the screen and you'll see a picture of me before the pandemic. That's, that's me right there, pre-pandemic. About a year later, post-pandemic, now this is me. <laughs> so Joseph saw to it that Jacob and his brother settled into the land and meanwhile, we just got to, I just want you to grab this. I want you to see the power that Joseph was wielding. Did you know that because of the famine, Joseph collected all of the silver in the land? All of it. But the famine was still going on. So how did the people begin to pay? They paid with their livestock. And did you know he collected all of it? They ran out. And so then the famine was still raging on. So how did they pay? They paid with land. All of it. And then they gave them seed to plant whatever you plant in a famine. And then they were going to get one-fifth of that. And so Pharaoh now owns all the silver, all the land, all the livestock, and one-fifth of whatever grows. And you think, well, that must mean that the children of Israel have nothing. They must really be struggling if that is the case. And yet, because God sent Joseph to preserve Israel and to provide a remnant, we see in Genesis 47, 27, that Israel became fruitful and multiplied greatly and was becoming numerous. And they lived there. Jacob continued to live there for 17 years. And it's like Israel is in this little bubble and they are growing and expanding and God's protecting them. It's like he has them in an incubator to grow them up and protect them and to keep his promises they are in a temporary home. And as death near Joseph, Joseph was made to promise that he would carry Jacob's bones from Egypt back to the land of Canaan. You know what? Jacob so believed the promises of God that at his death, he wanted to make sure they knew, take my bones back to the land of Canaan. 
He believed God's promises. Chapter 48, Jacob's blessing. When Joseph comes to his father, it says that Israel summoned his strength and set up in the bed. He looked in the distance and he saw Joseph's sons coming and said, Who are these? And and, and picture what's happening here. I mean, he never thought he would see Joseph again, and now he has. And not only that, he sees Joseph's sons. And these are not just sons, these are young men. And his eyes have seen them, and he invokes blessings upon them. He invokes blessings upon Manasseh and Ephraim. And then in chapter 49, we see Jacob's last words. He he just goes down the list. Reuben, you're not going to excel. You defiled my bed. Simeon and Levi, you lacked good judgment in retaliation over what was done to your sister. You lack good counsel, you're vicious, you're angry, you operate on whims. And he just goes right on down the list. Judah, your brothers will praise you and bow to you. And he says, Zebulun, you will live by the sea. And Issachar, that's the one we had a fun time with last week, Issachar. You think you is a car, but you're really a donkey. That's what it says right here in the text. Dan, you are a judge. Gad, you will be attacked. Asher, your food will be rich. Naphtali, you are a doe set free that bears beautiful fawns. Joseph, you are a fruitful vine beside a stream. You are attacked, but yet your bow remains steady. You are protected by the mighty one. Benjamin, you are a wolf. And as chapter 49 closes out, we're reminded these are the 12 tribes of Israel. And to all of them, Jacob said, don't forget to bury me with my family in the land of Canaan. Chapter 50, the end of the beginning. Jacob dies. Jacob was embalmed. Everybody, including the Egyptians, mourned for 70 days. Joseph, following his father's wishes, told Pharaoh that he needed to go and bury his father, and he took him to the land of Canaan. And it even remarks that the procession through the land was amazing and impressive. They all returned to Canaan, for this burial, and then they came back. But something happened. Those brothers realized, remember they were fearful and trembling and afraid. All of a sudden they realized that, oh my goodness, what's going to happen now that daddy is gone? Maybe Joseph has just been waiting. And now that daddy is gone, he's going to come after us. And I want you to watch this. Remember the tears of Joseph. It was a preface, a prelude. The book Paul's that, of Genesis of the not, yet, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. I'm so excited about it, too. I can't hardly wait. But the prelude is this. It is that his tears reminds us of the grace that's going to flow down. And he said, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You planned evil against me. God planned it for good to bring about the present result the survival of my people therefore don't be afraid I will take care of you and your children and he comforted them and spoke kindly to them hold up right there on the video not ready yet and then Genesis 50 Joseph said to his brothers I'm about to die but God will come to your aid and bring you up from this land that he swore to give to Abraham Isaac and Jacob so Joseph did the same thing he made the sons of Israel take an oath When God comes to your aid, carry my bones into the land of Canaan. As we come to a close this morning, I I want you to understand this. Joseph is confident. He is confident in the promises of God. And if you take a little sneak peek in Exodus 13, 19, it says Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. Promise kept. God's going to do what he says he's going to do. God keeps his promises. He can use men who can't talk. He can use men who are falsely accused. He can use those who are rejected by others. He can use those sold into slavery. He can even use those that act with evil intentions and turn it around to bring about the good plans of his salvation. That's our God. He is our creator. He holds the earth in its place. He causes the seasons to come and go. In Utah, he can do it in one day. He makes the sun to rise and set. And by the power of his word, he created. And by the power of the cross, he saves. And on that cross, it was Jesus 
not Joseph. On that cross, it was Jesus who died in our place. And throughout Genesis and throughout the Old Testament, because we see that God is faithful to keep his promises, we know he'll keep them today, and he'll keep them tomorrow, and he'll keep them for all eternity. We all will bow before Jesus one day. We will bow before him in this life, or we'll bow before him on that day before the judgment seat. And it'll be too late. Do you know him? Do you know the one who is upon the throne? Watch this. And everywhere you touch the book of Genesis and the story of Joseph, if you have a discerning eye, you're going to think of Jesus. He was the Father's well-beloved Son, the altogether lovely one the chiefest among many brethren. He could say, I do always those things that please the Father. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. The children of Israel hated him. They could not speak peaceably to him. They hated him for the life that he lived. And they hated him for the truth that he told. They hated him. And they conspired against him. They sold him for the price of a slave. Rejected by his kinsmen according to the flesh, he's handed over to the Gentiles. And there he is falsely accused and made to suffer for sins not his own. They put him in that dark dungeon, that place of death, but it wasn't long before he had the keys of that place. But that place could not hold Joseph. He came forth from that place, and he was exalted to the right hand of the majesty of the Pharaoh, and they gave him a name which was above every name, that at the name of Zaphnath Paanea every knee should bow and every tongue confess that he was Lord to the glory of the Pharaoh. And then they gave him a Gentile bride. And afterwards he began to deal with his kinsmen according to the flesh, the children of Israel. And he so worked upon them that they began to say to each other, we are verily guilty concerning our brother. And finally all nations came to Joseph. You see, there's nowhere that you touch the story of Joseph that you don't begin to think of Jesus. That's why 25% of the book of Genesis is devoted to the story of Joseph, a man who was just like Jesus. And Father, as we have walked through this season, as we've looked at your word in Genesis, Lord, we have looked at how Joseph is so much like you. We've seen what's coming. But Lord, we've really been preparing. Lord, in the next two Sundays, Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, we will see Jesus entering into the city of Jerusalem and making his way to the cross, being buried in a tomb, our sins on him, and then bursting forth into glorious day. Lord, what we've heard, what we've learned, and may it remind us of that, of your amazing grace. Lord Jesus, I pray for one who may be here today who's never, ever trusted you as Savior. Maybe they sang amazing grace earlier, but they don't know of it, not personally. I pray that today would be the day of salvation. That man, that woman, that boy, that girl within the sound of my voice would just cry out and say, Lord Jesus, save me a sinner. Set me free. Forgive me and give me everlasting life. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. 
Amazing Grace. Winston's going to play for us this morning. Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Has he saved you today? Oh, dear friend, if you don't know that you know Jesus, if you can't answer that question and say, yes, he saved me, why not today? Why not right now? You've never experienced anything like his amazing grace. I once was blind, but now I see. can relieve those. God's people said, amen. So good to be in the house of the Lord with you. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements that I want to uh, bring to your attention. First of all, didn't Winston play beautifully right there? I, I love that. <laughs> Maddie is heading up to Montana, up into the middle of nowhere, where I understand there are no Little Caesars or Wiener Schnitzels or McDonald's to visit her sister and the new baby and brother-in-law. So pray for them. But also next Sunday, Winston will be leading, and, and Christina, there's Christina, will be singing. And we're going to actually, at the end of the service, have a bit of a commissioning because these two are going to serve with David Mark and help with worship, leading worship at his church in Roy. Now, you know how I feel about these things. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. You know, you hate to see people go, but you love to see the kingdom grow. And uh, I want to be consistent in that. I believe that if we are following God's call on us as a church, we're going to see souls saved, we're going to see souls baptized, we're going to make disciples, and we're going to send people out. That's the way it goes. And so we're happy to be able to do that next week with Winston and Christina. Next Saturday, work day, 9 o'clock a.m. Did I get it right? If you can be here, men, women, boys, girls, whatever, whoever will come to work, next Sunday we're going to get it looking beautiful for Palm Sunday and Easter. Did I miss anything? Well, let's stand up this morning, if you will, and close in a word of prayer. Our Father, thank you today for meeting with us in this place. What a joy to worship with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for the book of Genesis. Lord, may it continue to stir in our heart. And even as we've gone through all of this today so quickly, may it build into us a desire to dig in further. And may we as your people get into your word. In Jesus' name, amen.